What you're about to hear is a conversation between myself and Dr. Asim Malhotra, a famous consultant cardiologist and close friend of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who himself has been tapped for a position in the new administration. I note that up front to call out the elephant in the room. Our conversation is going to be centered around data that colleagues and I have just published around LDL cholesterol and heart disease that will be controversial. Actually, we publish it tomorrow morning as I record this, but it's going to make big waves. Dr. Maholtra, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I want to get right into it. I know you read our new paper, which releases tomorrow morning to the public. What was your reaction to reading the paper? It was fascinating, um, Nick. I mean, really great work, what you've done. I think for me also, it, it seems consistent with what we already appear to know. At the very least, there needs to be a, a big question mark around the original understanding dogma on LDL cholesterol being a significant risk factor of heart disease, especially as you've pointed out, in people who are otherwise metabolically healthy. And when you bring that into the equation, you've then got to ask yourself whether or not it is truly an independent risk factor for heart disease. William Craftelli, co-director of Framingham, 1996, actually said, looking at going back over Framingham data, that LDL cholesterol, unless it was above 300 milligrams per deciliter, or 7.8 millimoles per liter, depending on which country you're in and what units you use, it had essentially no value in isolation in predicting heart disease. So it's very consistent with what we already know, Nick. I think that's why it's, it's such a good paper. Thank you. But would you agree with this? You just mentioned LDL in isolation. But I don't think we've actually had a population of people up until this point who, as a population, isolate LDL as a risk factor. Because we have generally in the population, metabolic dysfunction as a background, or we look towards familial hypercholesterolemia. And it's talked about as if it was just high LDL. But I'm sure you'd agree, like FH is a lot more. Also, the etiology matters, the cause. Like if you're born with very high LDL because you have a broken lipid receptor, that's very different than a metabolic response. You you're agree? actually right. So I think there's two points to be made there. Um, so the first one in reference to what you said, yes, this is the first time I think this has been studied in this way. But interestingly, uh, David Diamond and Paul Mason, I don't know if you read that paper, they did a review of looking at statin trials, specifically what they found in subgroup analysis of both primary and secondary prevention statin trials, which is very interesting, was that those subgroups that had normal triglycerides and HDL got no benefit whatsoever from the statin, which is, which is interesting. Mm. But also on FH, so I was involved in some research uh, looking at FH uh, with a number of international scientists. And this is a very interesting one. So the, the big headline for FH, and this is, these are people I manage, by the way. So I'll give you some examples of what I found in my clinical practice, which also seems to be consistent with the research, okay? Is uh, in people with FH, 70% of women and uh, unselected and 50% of men with FH, right, genetically high cholesterol, mm -hmm. will not develop premature heart disease. So the question then is, is there any factors that differentiate those ones that do develop heart disease versus the ones that don't? When you look at the LDL, they're the same. So LDL isn't the differentiating factor. They're obviously very high in both of them, but it's not the differentiating factor. Mm -hmm. what, what is the differentiating factors? Well, insulin resistance, so type 2 diabetes, hypertension, smoking, obviously. Um, Lipoprotein little a and fibrinogen. Mm. So I've had many patients come to me. Some of them, by the way, are probably lean mass hyperresponders, right, in their 50s, mm -hmm. but some of them are true FH. And I look at their insulin resistance markers and I, we go through the history and say, listen, actually, you don't appear to be at high risk. They're, these people are fit and active, but they've been scared by their doctor that their cholesterol LDL is so high, like 250, 300, like in similar to the people in your study. And uh, they literally think that, you know, they've got the fear of death put into them, and the, but they're a bit reluctant. They're a bit skeptical and they want to get a second opinion. So what do I do? I organize CT coronary angiograms for them. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, they come back completely normal, right. which means that it just reinforces that for them, these people, some of these with FH, uh, especially females, that the, if, if cholesterol is a problem for them, if LDL is a problem for them, by your mid 50s, late 50s, early 60s, you will see some degree of atherosclerosis and there is nothing there, Nick, nothing. Yeah. No, my mom falls into that category. She's um, a MD, PhD, and she's had high cholesterol all her life. But when she went low carb, it went even higher. So lean mass hyperresponder on top of congenitally high LDL. Probably 
one sixties, 200 LDL, most of her life. Um, and then she became a lean mass hyperresponder several years ago, LDLs in the four hundreds. She's having her 60th birthday, actually two days. Today's, uh, April 6th or 60th is on April 8th. Happy birthday, mom. Um, but she wanted to know whether or not she should go on a statin. I said, just like get cardiac imaging. You're a physician. You know, you know what this means. Get a CCTA, zero plaque score, no plaque. And that made the decision for her. 